hearing from and we'll get started in about a minute and a half. Oh, welcome from North Carolina. Glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome, Paula from Glasgow, Seth from Somerset. So glad you're here. For those that are just logging in, we're going to get started in about a minute. For now, locate that chat box and toggle the two icon from all panelists to all panelists and attendees to ensure we can see your questions and comments as we move along today. Before we get started, now's a good time to open up a Word document so you can be ready to copy and paste some good resources from the chat box as we move along. And we'll get started soon. Oh, welcome Lee from Lexington. Glad you're here. Welcome Aaron. Great to see you here. Mary and Kobe, glad you're here from Louisville. Tanya Parsons has just put some good information on the Small Business Development Center. Uh, in the chat box. That's a good one to copy and paste into a Word document. Welcome Joe from Georgetown. Welcome. Welcome to those that are just logging in. We're going to get started very soon, about 30 seconds. For now, please locate the chat box and toggle the two icon from all panelists to all panelists and attendees to ensure we can see your questions and comments as we move along today. Now is a great time to go ahead and open up a Word document so you can copy and paste from the chat box to good resources as we go. And we'll get started very soon. All right, welcome to those that are just joining. We're getting ready to get started here. For now, locate the chat box and toggle the two icon from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. Now is a good time to open up a Word document so you can copy and paste resources as we move along the presentation today. My name is Amanda Shagney. I'm with UK Alumni Career Services, and I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Caroline Francis to do our welcome today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Central Kentucky Job Club. We're delighted that you've joined us. Today, we're going to give you an overview of Job Club. Um, we'll have an opportunity for you to share some success stories from the floor. Uh, we will have our main speaker that I'm thrilled about. Uh, we'll share jobs activities, uh, job postings, active postings, and then we'll give you a little information about what's coming up from our partners programming wise in our next Job Club meetings. Uh, this is a reminder that Job Club is currently in Zoom webinar, so participants in the webinar can see and hear, but attendees are not active on mics or cameras. If you choose to participate in the chat box, your name will be public to the group, so we just want to let you know that, uh, but we do love seeing all the awesome conversation and feedback that we get in our chat boxes, so thank you all and keep that coming during today's program. We want to welcome those on Facebook Live. Uh, if you would like to en engage in the Job Club comments, um, receive our newsletters, um, you'll need to sign up at our website. Um, you won't be able to engage um, live through the chat box, but the newsletter feature, we'd be delighted to add you to that, is www.ukalumni.net forward slash job club. Use that to register for future job club programs. Also, employers and recruiters are always welcome at job club. We really enjoy employers dropping in and sharing leads with us. If you are an employer with an active job lead, we will give you a guest speaking privilege at the end of the program today. You'll have one minute to share an active job lead. So we'll look forward to those if you uh, have a lead to share with us, or if you're a job seeker and participating and have some job leads to share, we'd love for you to pay it forward as well. Nicole? Okay, hello everyone. Hey, Facebook Live. Uh, thank you guys for joining us uh, as already mentioned today. So. I definitely want to tell you who our facilitators are uh, for Job Club, and we're going to start start out with Diana Doggett, uh, who is our county extension agent for family and consumer. Um, uh, sorry, she's at the county extension and agent and and family consumer sciences at Fayette County Extension Office. <clears throat> Excuse me, and of course we have Carolyn, who just got done speaking. Um, Carolyn Francis, 
the Director of Alumni and Career Services at UK Alumni Association. And joining her is Amanda Shackney, Associate Director of Alumni Career Services at UK Alumni Association. And then we have myself, of course, Nicole. I'm Nicole Waite. I'm an Employment Specialist at the University of Kentucky. Uh, I work in the Temporary Employment Office, better known as SEPS. Uh, and we do not want to fail to mention, or unless they give a shout out to Ellie Goodman, UK Alumni Association, <clears throat> excuse me, Hannah Sims, UK Alumni Association, and Susan Smith, Fayette County Extension Office. Okay, here our mission uh, to provide a positive environment for job seekers to network and learn best practices for the job search. Uh, we meet on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month, and you can find the schedule of topics at www ukalumni.net slash job club. Uh, our current schedule is tentative as we are adapting to the needs of our audience right now and shifting to Zoom webinar format due, of course, to COVID-19. Some people in the webinar are conducting a confidential job search. So we wanna keep that in mind. So let's please be respectful of privacy for the job search of others. Check out job search related articles included in our job club reminder emails. Uh, please keep engagement in the chat box positive, as always. Alrighty, so I'm going to pass it on to Diana. Thanks, Nicole. Well, don't let me do that. Does my host have stopped it? There we go. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Um, yes, we do want to uh, welcome everyone, especially is everyone. Am I good? Especially our first timers, and uh, we want to remind you that we're glad you're here. And uh, we will follow up with you in a survey later today. And uh, it's very short, but it, this feedback does help us place you in our notification system for future programs. So you will be notified of each and every program once you have uh, registered with this very short survey. And we want to remind you that um, we, to take time to review our free job club resource packet. And this packet is, includes lots of different um, um, uh, assets for job search. And if you look down through the list, we have job search uh, facts and questions. We have Central Kentucky networking opportunities, informational interview tips, um, articles of interest for job seekers, a resume review checklist and a verb list, as well as a LinkedIn job search checklist. So you can um, find this packet in, at ukalumni.net slash job club welcome packet. And we also encourage you to join the Central Kentucky Job Club sharing community on linkedin.com. And the address is on your screen. So um, these free resources are for you and, and after many times we'll address these uh, subjects, but you always have this as a go-to uh, and good, good reference. And now it's time for us to, um, to recognize and to celebrate success stories. So we always love to offer that um, invitation for those in the audience to just uh, go to the chat box and tell us what's been happening. Um, <clears throat> success stories are, um, they range from getting an interview, updating your resume, um, networking with, with someone that's uh, giving you a great lead um, to even a, a job securement. So um, if you wanna take, take some time now and just let us hear from you, we will watch the chat box and see who's out there that is willing to share what's happened over the last couple of months, weeks, months. Anybody, anyone out there? Here we go. Okay, we've got, we've got referrals. 
Um, hoping to hear back. First in-person interview this afternoon. Oh, wow, that's awesome. And uh, been laid off since February. So that's, um, that's even more reason to celebrate that this interview, we hope this interview goes really well. First one in 10 years. We hope that some information you have um, secured from, from Job Club is going to help you with that. Um, good, uh, we, have, we have Jill, who is starting with UK Steps on Monday. Wonderful, you'll hear more about UK Steps later in the program. Um, a client got a job offer from a great local organization. Another client got an interview last week. It sounds promising. Good luck on that. Allison. And we're, um, we're still, oh wow, this is just, this is so, this is awesome. Um, have an interview for role after an administrative fellowship. So that's, that seems, that's, We'll hope, be very hopeful with you on that. And I don't know if I missed any, I'm hoping I did it, but we really, really uh, appreciate those that shared. We want um, transitioning military, entering the civilian workforce soon. So we hope that all of that goes well Give you our best regards on that, and we're here to help you. So this is, you know, normally in in a in an in person uh, job club situation, uh, these folks would be sharing this um, personally, but we are thrilled that they've shared it with us virtually, and um, we'll look forward to hearing from those of you who who gain success in the next two weeks uh, to share in the chat box. Good news, good news. All right. So I now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. And um, this is, we have, we're not surprised that we have such a large audience today because this is a tough subject. And this is one that um, everyone really would like the inside track information. And so Sally Trent is here to share uh, about negotiating and we're, we're just thrilled about that. I'm gonna read just a, uh, a short uh, bio for her because she comes so well qualified. Uh, Sally Trent is an HR and career development professional who has spent her life guiding others toward lifelong learning, career growth and personal en enrichment. Shelly's background includes human resources, college career services, corporate, corporate employer career development, and business and industry training. Shelly is certified as a senior professional in human resources by the HR Certification Institute as a SHRM senior certified professional, and also obtained her master's degree in public administration with an emphasis in HR. She completed her PhD coursework at the University of Louisville in human resources development and career counseling. She is an adjunct faculty member in the School of Business at Indiana University's Southeast Campus, where she teaches business students about career planning, business behaviors, and job search. Shelley has been interviewed for and quoted in pub publications such as Essence Magazine, Workforce Magazine, Pittsburgh Business Times, Kansas City Business Journal, and is a frequent writer and contributor on various HR and career management topics for books, magazines, and other publications. We are just thrilled to have Shelly here and look forward to your presentation, Shelly. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. So I think somebody's going to move my slides ahead, right? There we go. Thank you so much. So I'm going to talk about negotiating salary and benefits and how to know what you're worth. 
in the market? Because a lot of people say, you know, I don't know what to say when they ask me about my salary requirements. I don't really know how much I should be asking for, uh, or I'm not really sure how to go about the whole negotiation pro process. If you want to go ahead. Thanks. So one of the things that makes negotiation really hard is we don't want to risk that we've made, been made an offer maybe and, and that they might rescind the offer if we ask for too much or if we seem like we're being too pushy. So we don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to hurt our chances of getting the job. We want people to like us. We don't want to start off the employment relationship in a negative way. And we care what other, other people think but then we also question what we're, what our own value is. You know, am I worth that kind of salary that I'm asking for? And we tend to be emotional under stress. And so sometimes it comes across as fearful or not very confident. Um, and we avoid conflict and stressful situations. And it can be more difficult for women because of the, the pay gap. So women tend to make less on the dollar than men. I think it's something like 88 cents. I think, uh, um, uh, I know it's less than a dollar. So we automatically make less as women. So it's more difficult. But you have to remember that you are selling yourself as a product for the employer to purchase. I know that sounds kind of cold, but you have to figure out what your price tag is. You can go ahead. Next slide, there we go, thanks. You never wanna start off an interview asking about salary, benefits, or time off. Sometimes they'll ask you, maybe even before the interview, what's your salary requirement? They do that because they need a place to start. They want, they wanna know if they can afford you. Maybe their range is different than what your range is. And we're gonna talk about how to figure out what your range should be. Um, but you have to you have to wait until you've been offered a job to really have this conversation in depth because you want that to be your bargaining chip. You want to talk about salary benefits, things like that. Once you've had an offer, not right away. I know I have had some students and clients who they want to know before they even interview. You know, is this going to be worth my time? What am I going to get out of this? But until you've been made an offer, it's about what's in it for the company, not what's in it for you. Next slide. Thank you. <clears throat> so before the interview, you have to do some research. What are you worth? You can look at salaries on uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, I have the link here. You. They have a, a lag because they do the studies, you know, they're always researching, um, but their studies that are posted are a year or two off. So you might need to add, I don't know if it's seven to nine percent, maybe five percent right now um, because of the economy. But do your research, look up what you would be worth for your geographic area, for your type of position for your level of education and the number of years of experience you have. And for, for example, if you are in Louisville, Kentucky versus maybe Somerset because of the size of the cities, um, the pay scale might be different in those communities because of the size of the city and, and the expense of living. Um, if you have an associate's degree, your salary would be different from someone who maybe has a master's degree. So these are the th sorts of things you need to put in when you do your research on, on BLS. You can also look on salary.com and payscale.com. However, figures there tend to be higher than reality. So they can be off as much as 30 to 40%. So I would look at the BLS because those are more real-time numbers. And then also you can look at glassdoor.com and the ladders.com. Go ahead. So when you're also um, thinking about what you should earn, you want to figure out what you have to make to live. Sometimes that matches up and sometimes it doesn't. 
sometimes maybe the career you want is in a nonprofit and your budget says, I need a lot more money. <laughs> so you wanna figure that out before you go into salary negotiation. You want to also think about that every expense that you have includes savings, contingencies. I'm gonna actually show you a budget worksheet on a future slide. And you don't have to tell anyone your salary requirement. Um, but this provides you a basis doing a worksheet, figuring out all of your expenses. A lot of people only think about the big things like a car payment and my mortgage and um, maybe food or, or things like that. They don't think about all of their living expenses for a year. So you want to enter negotiation knowing what you're worth according to BLS and how much you need to have to live. Go ahead. I'll get to that question in just a second, Lauren. So here is a worksheet that I give my clients and students because it includes things beyond the big expenses every month. Things like um, insurance, HOA dues, uh, any loans that you might have, credit card payments, your monthly utilities and cell phone bill, uh, groceries and sundries, housewares, entertainment, gas, clothes, gifts for, you know, birthdays, weddings, holidays, personal property taxes, all, you know, if you have daycare expenses, if you subscribe to anything, these days not very many people get newspapers anymore, but you might have expenses on a monthly basis for, like I pay for LinkedIn on a monthly fee because I want um, the, the uh, premium. So those types of things would be on there. Healthcare, health club membership, haircuts, lawn care, repairs, on and on and on. You don't think about all those things, that, that, but you have to know how much you really need to live. So if you work on this worksheet, um, I think that will be very helpful to you to find out what you must have to live. And keep in mind that your net paycheck is usually about 28 to 30% less than the salary they offer you due to the taxes that are taken out. Okay, go ahead. Um, so somebody asked you, asked earlier in the chat, you know, what if they ask me in the job application or in the, in the first phone call, what's your salary requirement? That's why you want to know what you're worth. Do some research too. If you go to glassdoor.com, sometimes it'll tell you um, salaries that people have been offered for a job. Uh, so that's another place to look, but you have to know what you're worth to give an answer. Hopefully, your answer matches up with what they're going to pay. However, if you really need 45,000 or 50,000 to live on and they offer you 35, you're probably not gonna be satisfied with that. So maybe it's better that you don't get that position just because it's not gonna pay your bills. You're always gonna be behind on everything. Um, but don't throw out a number. Don't just say, well, I really want to get 80. So I'm going to say 80 because you might be really over and they might say, oh, we can't afford you. So the interview won't ever happen. That's why you want to do that research. If you're forced to give a number and you've done your research, you want to give kind of a wide range, maybe even with a $10,000 bump. So if, if, if you find out that you're worth 50, maybe you wanna give a, a 48 to 58 range, something like that, something that you'll be happy with though, because you know, like I said, if you're gonna be offered 15, 20,000 less than what you can afford to live on, that's, that's not a good fit. So make sure that when you give that range that the bottom number is still acceptable to you. And talk about what's appropriate for the role. You can tell them, I've done research on what this position should probably pay. You know, you can even say, I'm guessing here, but it looks like um, based on the research I've done that it should pay from here to here. Um, if you impress them enough, they're going to want to pay you. That's why you want to wait and use the salary discussion as a bargaining chip at the end after you've uh, had a job offer because once you have an offer they really want you and they're going to work with you on salary usually and we'll talk more about that in a second go ahead so if they ask again i, I mentioned this earlier if they ask for your uh, salary history or range uh, 
they just want to know a starting point for negotiation. You don't have to tell them your current salary. In fact, in some states that has already become illegal um, and it's being worked on, I think federally, if I'm not mistaken, but you, because you, you shouldn't be paid based on what you've been paid in the past, because maybe you were underemployed. Maybe you have an MBA and you have all this experience, but you just had to take a job at Lowe's or something, you know, during COVID because you're, you're, you've lost your position. So you shouldn't be, and they shouldn't be either basing your salary in your new job on what you're making now. And they shouldn't really be asking that. They should base it on what's the fair market value of that position in your area with someone with your skills. Don't lie about your past salary, though, because reference checks could provide that information. Usually, a past employer is not going to say what you made, but there's always a chance that somebody in one company is really good friends with somebody in another company, and they can say, well, what did this person make? Um, so don't want, you don't want to lie. Go ahead. If the company won't tell you what the salary range is and they insist that you share your salary history, just respond with your total, your most recent total compensation, maybe in the last good job you had, um, not necessarily the job you might have now if you are underemployed. If you don't know what that is, find out. So if you say something like, well, my, if you think through this, my salary was A, my annual bonus was B, my employer's contribution to my 401k was C. So altogether, your compensation package should be A but plus B plus C. But you have to know that information to figure out what your, really, uh, what your real pay was. Go ahead to the next one. And usually benefits are about 30% of your pay. So that's a good round number. And I think I might have a slide on that in a minute. So after the interview, if they've made you an offer, don't accept it on the spot. Tell them that you want to think it over 24 hours, 48 hours or something like that. I would not accept a job offer without getting something in writing. And it's OK if they want to send it via email, they want to send you a letter via email, what it is, whatever that is. Um, but get something in writing. I will tell you some stories that have happened where an interviewer you know, they don't necessarily work in HR, but the interviewer might say, oh, yeah, yeah, we can get you that salary. If you really want 80, we, I'll make that happen. I'll work it out with HR. Well, they can't. Sometimes they go to HR and HR says, no, the top of this range is only 70. We can't pay 80. So get it in writing. Make sure you know all of the details of the position. You want to get a job description uh, and if you don't already have one. You want to see what the salary is, what the benefits are, the paid time off, all of that. You want to get something like that in writing. You want to ask them for the total rewards package. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in a moment. And ask around to see if, if anyone you know works there. You know, it could be you want to ask questions about what's the working environment like? What's the culture like? Do you know my, my for the person who's going to be my boss? And what's that person like? Um, Ask about reality because, you know, you might find out from people that it's not a very good place to work and maybe you don't want to work there, but you need to do that research. And if you look on Glassdoor, that's a really good place for uh, learning about company cultures and how people are treated. Now, of course, you might have um, in any company, you'll have a few people who are, you know, grouchy and they're putting on their their personal experience but if you look at the over, overall score you know if they have a four star review um, that's a pretty good bet that it's going to be a good place to work so then you want to sign and return the letter as your formal acceptance of the offer and or you can counter the offer or you can decline the offer we'll talk about that next <clears throat> so so as I mentioned, benefits combined are worth about 30 to 35% of your total compensation package, according to the DOL. So for a salary of 75,000, your company pays between 225 and 26,250 for your benefits. That would be your health insurance, all, all of the benefits that you get, your time off, whatever, that all kind of equals that amount. 
So your total rewards then would be about $97,000. So you want to be sure, especially if you're going to go into an organization that doesn't have great benefits or maybe they don't pay for your benefits, you want to figure out that your benefits would be about 30% onto your salary. Go ahead. So what's in the total rewards package? Some people think, oh, it's just, you know, my, my pay, my benefits, blah, blah, blah. But it's a lot. It's a lot of other things. So think about all these things that the company offers them. These things should be calculated into your salary figures. So you want to find out, does the company offer health uh, health care? And some of them have dental and vision benefits. A 401k, sorry, I'm getting stumbling on my words here, 401k company match. So they might put in a certain percentage toward your 401k and match what you've put in. They might have life insurance. Usually it's something like twice your salary. So if you are going to earn 50, they might have a life insurance policy of 100,000. Um, they might have pension. Not very many places have it, but uh, some of them do. Looks like Q&A slide at the end. Okay, I'll wait till then. Um, tuition assistance, that can be worth $5,000 a year or more if they pay for you to go to school. Uh, then of course there's time off, holiday leave, sick leave, vacation time, bereavement, uh, military leave, overtime, comp time, all of those types of things. Training and development, are you going to be able to continue your education, not necessarily college classes, but maybe you have a certification and you need to go to a conference every year to keep up your, your certification. So maybe they'll pay for that and that can be expensive as well. Do they have an employee assistance program? Do they have flexible spending, profit sharing, stock options, commission or bonuses? Maybe there's an annual bonus based on performance. Uh, company car, boy, that would be a nice savings, wouldn't it, of like $500 a month for a car payment? Some of them have a cell phone that they'll give you, a laptop, um, health club memberships, relocation, and then, of course, you hope that it's good um, corporate culture. Maybe you get to work from home. Hopefully, during COVID, you would. And then parking. Parking is huge. If you have to work in downtown Louisville, and you know some of you might be more rural, but if you have to work in downtown Louisville and park every day, that can be several hundred dollars a month. It's so expensive. So if the company has free parking, that's almost like pay. Go ahead to the next one. So let's talk about a couple of examples of total rewards. Let's do a comparison. So here at ABC Company, they're offering you $50,000. For their bonus, they're going to offer you up to 10% of your salary based on performance, which would be about $5,000. They give you annual raises of 5% based on your performance. They have a matching 401k of up to 6% of your income, about $3,000. They also have stock options and pension. People don't have pension much anymore, so wow, that's great. They have 12 paid holidays, a paid personal day, 12 sick days, and 10 vacation days. That's a lot of time off. Plus, they have family medical insurance, and they pay $1,200 a month. You pay zero. <clears throat> Prescription coverage, you only pay $15 copay. Vision, $20 copay. They have an on-site fitness center that doesn't cost you anything. They have wellness programs, paid pregnancy and adoption leave, employee assistance program. They have life insurance of twice your annual salary, tuition assistance of $5,200 a year, paid parking, casual dress code, and you get off at noon on Fridays during June and July. So, just your health care of $1,200 a month is a value of $14,400 a month. You don't pay that. They pay that. So if you do that math, you're, if you're only counting your health care costs, you are really making $64,400, right? So go to the next one. So at XYZ Corporation, they're offering you $65,000 which, wow, $15,000 difference, that seems huge. They give an annual raise of 2%. They have a 2% matching 401k. They just have seven holidays, six, uh, seven sick, and five vacation. You pay $500 a month for your health care, and they pay seven, and they don't have any other benefits. This is it. So if you think about it, 
your benefit value that they're paying is 8,400, but the be benefit that you pay is 6,000 and they don't have paid parking. So you're paying $1,200 a year. So if you look at the two total rewards packages, the one that pays 65,000 really pays less than the one that pays 50,000. So that's the kind of information you need to have when you're comparing jobs. Go to the next one. So from the HR perspective, I wanna share with you that typically a company is only allowed to pay within a range for a job. They might not be able to go outside of that range. Like I said earlier, sometimes people might promise that yes, I can get you 80, but they really can't when they go to HR. They might be required also to start a new employee at the bottom of the range or close to the low end of the range. And this is important. Some organizations pay for the job and not the person. So I'll give you an example. The first job, one of the first jobs I ever had was in a college career services office. They required a bachelor's degree and two years of experience. I had a master's degree and maybe five years of experience, but they didn't pay for my skill. They paid for the jobs requirements. So they were only gonna pay for the, the bachelor's degree in two years. So even though I brought more to the table, they only paid for the job. And so some of them pay for your skills, your education and things like that. So that gives you a little bit more negotiation room if you can find that out. Go to the next one. So I wanted to give you again from the HR perspective, a sample compensation structure. And I just made this up, but this is kind of common. So a grade nine would be the CEO and then the VPs, directors, managers, supervisors, skilled staff and administrative. So that's pretty typical. So let's just say you want a grade six, you want to be a manager. So a grade six might have this type of salary range. The starting point might be 50,000, the midpoint might be 75,000, and the high point might be 100,000. And the ranges are usually pretty good because let's just say you started your job at $50,000 10 years ago, you've gotten raises and bonuses and whatever, so you might be making 75 by now based on your time in, your, in the job. And the high point, you know, if you stay there for a long time, you'll be making 100,000 depending on how long you've been there. Go ahead to the next one. <clears throat> so with that um, salary range, again, you know, if you insisted that you needed 110,000, this company can't pay you more um, than the people who already work there making the highest end of the range. Also, I want to tell you about something called red circling. Um, and this is an HR term, but it means basically like if you've been at your company for 20 years and you're making $100,000 and you still have five years before you're going to retire, it means that you're red circled. It means you're maxed out on pay raises. You can't earn any more than $100,000 because that's the high point. It might mean for five years, you're not going to get a raise or a bonus because you're at the, at the max um, number. That happened to me at a job I used to work at where people who had been in the director level, we reorganized and so everybody's position was at the manager level. They didn't take their pay, but they couldn't get a raise because they were making director salary in a manager role. Go to the next one. So how do you evaluate your job offer? You wanna make a list of pros and cons and do this in writing to really think it through. As I mentioned, salary negotiation starts after you get a job offer. And after the offer, if you're not satisfied with what they've offered you, you can always counter, but you wanna do so in writing and be very specific because they might not accept your counter offer. They might not work with you. They might say, first offer is last offer. We don't have the wiggle room to, to negotiate. Um, but you wanna be able to say, if they do have uh, room for negotiation, you wanna be able to say exactly what it is you want. So the pros in this case would be working from home, that you get an annual bonus, you have a good vacation package, um, you have potential for growth, you have good coworkers according to what you've read, and it fits with your personal values. The cons would be they don't have tuition assistance. You have kind of a lower level job title, even though the pay is okay, um, or a lower than expected salary. 
So if you really, in this case, it looks like a pretty good job other than, you know, the pay might not be great, but you might say, well, I understand that you can't pay me more, but I'd like to go back to school. Would you be willing to pay for one class a semester? And maybe they will, even though they don't have tuition assistance, maybe they'll work that out with you. So you'll take the position. Okay, next. So as I mentioned, if you are um, taking a look at the, uh, the offer, you want to pr provide them with a solution. This is what it'll take to get me to take the position. If X can be changed, I'll accept. But don't play the you shot low, so I'll shoot high game, hoping to come in the middle. Uh, you don't want to give a huge range doing that because sometimes employers are like, uh, you know, this person's just going to play these games when they know we can't really afford that. So if they say 40 and you say 50, that's just too far off. Um, you, you know, you might say a $5,000 range would be okay, but that's, you know, that they probably can't afford that if you, if they made you the offer of 40, unless you've done research and you say, mm, I think you can, um, but be sure to know what you're talking about there. Um, and salaries are more rigid at the entry level. So they, they might not have wiggle room if you're coming in at the low end. Maybe you don't have the education that they hoped for or something like that. Um, but sometimes if salary cannot be adjusted, other benefits can be, like I mentioned, tuition assistance or something like that, or working from home on Fridays or whatever it might be. If they have other good candidates who are equal to you and they're willing to work with the employer on salary, they might just say, you know, this other person will accept what we're going to pay. Um, but don't act desperate about needing more money or, or needing the job. That's, that's never going to help you if you act desperate. Go to the next one. So if you're going to accept the offer, once you've decided to take the job, you wanna contact the interviewer right away. Don't make them wait. If you said 24 hours, you wanna contact them because they'll be waiting for your response. You wanna follow up with an email that recounts the understanding that you have of the offer. Maybe, you know, sign the letter that they've given you. Um, if they, hopefully they've given you something in writing, like I mentioned and stop interviewing for other jobs. This is something I hear about all the time. And you know, HR people, we all know each other. We all talk. Um, if you're interviewing for more jobs after you've accepted, I actually read an article about this just maybe last week. One HR person made an offer. The other HR person said, oh, this person's interview with us next week. And so they both said, we're not gonna interview you when we're pulling the offer because you're still interviewing after you've accepted the job. So that's a big no-no. Your reputation is at stake um, and your offer could be rescinded. Another example I will give, and this is somebody I know well who did this. He's in a, in a field that everybody knows each other. It's a very small field. And he had an interview on Monday he had another interview set up for Tuesday and another one for Wednesday, three days in a row, different companies. He got an offer on the very first um, interview on Monday. So he just didn't show up for his other two interviews. He didn't call. He didn't contact them. He just didn't show up. Well, because that's a small field, well, you don't want to do that anyway, but it's a small field. So everyone knows everyone else in the field. And your reputation is shot when <laughs> people talk. So you don't want to do that either. Go ahead and to the next one. How to decline an offer. Maybe you've decided it's just not going to pay enough or the culture is not the right fit or you found something out you didn't like. So if you're sure you don't want the job, also don't make them wait. Be responsive, don't put it off. I know it's very difficult to turn down an offer. And I've made this mistake myself in my career years ago, I would email them or, or, or something and, and say, I've decided to decline the offer, but you wanna call. Uh, that's just good manners. And you want to explain why you didn't accept the position, but show your sincere appreciation for their time. Their, their consideration of you for the position because you never know. In six months, maybe there's another job open there and you apply and they'll re-interview you. So you don't wanna burn a bridge. So again, you wanna explain the reasons why you can't accept, but don't provide any negative responses. You don't wanna say, well, your, your salary range is just too low. I can't accept it. 
you want to say something like, after discussing it with my family, I've decided I really need a higher salary to meet our living expenses. I understand your budget restrictions. And if the situation changes, I hope we can discuss it again in the future. That's much more positive. And you want to follow up your conversation with a formal email, again, restating the points. Go ahead. So how to be a better negotiator. You want to view yourself as an agent for Team U, for your organization, who you are. Women especially are um, not really good negotiators necessarily, and they, they do a better job if they think about it this way. They're negotiating for their family or they're negotiate, pretend if you don't have a family, pretend like you're negotiating for someone else who you care about. You might have seen there's a car commercial. I think it's Nissan. And there's a woman on the sidewalk with her boss and it's a, a male boss. And she sa he says, well, I hate to tell you, I'm not gonna be able to get you that raise again this year, um, but I'll try again next year. And so her friend comes speeding up on the sidewalk there, say, get in. She gets in the car, they ride really fast around the block. She brings her back and says, uh, get out there and negotiate. And so she, holds her, her chest out and her shoulders back and says, I want my raise. So I don't know if you've seen that, but that's what it makes me think about. You have to fight for yourself and you're negotiating so that you can have more money and resources to take care of. It could be your parents, your children, your loved ones, whoever it is who, who you take care of. And that's not to say that men can't do the same thing, um, but you know, women aren't as good sometimes at fighting for themselves. You want to build your case by pretending you're asking on someone else's behalf. And, you know, what supporting data would you provide? So provide that data for yourself. Go ahead. I also want to talk about how to negotiate for a promotion. To advance yourself, you need to advocate for yourself. <clears throat> Throughout your career, you want to ask your boss for feedback on an ongoing basis, not just once a year, maybe once a month. You want to have a sit down with your boss and say, how can I improve in my position? What am I doing well? What am I not doing so well? Because your boss might not have time on a daily basis to say, you know, I really wish you would have focused on this differently or, or whatever it may be. So ask, ask your boss, can, I, can we sit down once a month and have a discussion about my performance? That way you are never surprised. And you always know what you can do to improve. Also, don't apply for a new job internally without notifying your boss. I know this has happened where I've worked a few times where, you know, I'm in HR, someone will come to me and say, I just found out one of my employees applied for a promotion in this other department. That doesn't look good. You always want to go to your boss and say, I just want to let you know that there's a job in XYZ department and I, I am interested, you know, I'm not unhappy in this job, but I just think maybe... I'd like to consider this as a promotion. And it's okay, your boss will probably understand, but be, be sure to tell your boss. Also be responsible for your own career growth. Don't work in a place and just assume, oh, they're gonna send me to training when I need it. Always be on the lookout for things, you know, and nowadays oh, there are so many webinars and they're free. Always be looking out for ways you can improve your skills, your intelligence, your education, whatever it is. Get certifications, but always be improving yourself for your job. Find out as much as you can about the job you want. Now, you, you might be already thinking about, you know, if, if you're going to get promoted, what might that look like? What job might you want to get next? And so you want to do research on wh where you want to be. Let's just say if you are in human resources like I am, maybe you are you have the title of manager and you really want to be an HR director in your next job. Well, look at a bunch of um, job postings for director and find out what they do that you don't already do and learn that information. So if it says it requires a master's degree for most of the director jobs and you don't have one, start working on your master's degree. If it says you need this certification, start working on your certification. Figure out ways to bridge that gap. And talk to other people. Do networking with people who do that job um, so that you can learn more about what's required. Go ahead. So negotiating for a promotion. Ask your boss to start giving you work that's a little bit uh, above what you do. 
because they want to try you out. They want to see, can this person handle a promotion? Can they handle the extra work? You want to build a case for why you deserve a promotion, but you have to prove yourself first. You want to create an outline for your boss that covers the metrics of the impact you've had. What have you done in your work that has gone above and beyond what you're supposed to do? Descriptions of solutions you've delivered that makes work easier, more efficient, more cost-effective, whatever it might be. Financial outcomes for which you've been responsible, maybe cost savings, um, and data from other departments, coworkers, or customers that point to your success. You can't just go in and say, I need a raise. You need to be able to prove why you deserve a raise. Um, you need to also prove that you're already working at the level or that you can handle the level of work that you're going to be promoted to. Next slide. Negotiating for a raise. <clears throat> Again, don't ask for a raise, especially if your company is in trouble. Right now with COVID, it might not be a good time to ask for a raise, um, but you wanna plan to meet for your boss. You, you wanna go in when something good has just happened so that your boss is in a good mood. Um, maybe you wanna do it at the end of your performance review if your performance review was really positive, or maybe after completing a big project, uh, you've done something successful and you say, now that I finished this project and I've proven myself, do you think I could get a raise? You do not want to say, I have another job offer. I will tell you a lot of people do that because they think, well, if I tell them I have an offer and they wanna keep me, they'll give me more money. Well. It, from the HR perspective, once you've told us that you have another job offer, we're always going to be suspicious that you're looking. Always. You know, five years later, we're going to think as soon as more money comes along, this person will leave. So don't use that tactic. It might work for some people, but it's probably not going to work. If they give you a raise, it, they're not going to trust you anymore. Uh, you want to go into your meeting with your supervisor. Again, proof that you're working beyond your job description for a certain amount of time. You're doing work that's been added to your normal job. Proof that you've had, again, a successful project. And you wanna go in with your desired salary figure and specifically outline why you think you deserve that much. And you, just like when you did, when I'm telling you about doing your research for how much you're worth, again, this is how you would figure that out. Go to the next one. So I know that there were some questions in the chat, but I will conclude here by, you have to know what you're worth by doing your research. You have to understand your bargaining power. Know that when you negotiate, it's your, it's your bargaining chip. It's something that you take in at the end to say, you want me, now here's how you get me. You don't say that, but, but that's how you should feel about it. You wanna fight for what you deserve. I sound like one of those, um, ambulance chaser, lawyer commercials, fight for what you deserve. And you wanna be confident about it. Don't wanna seem wishy-washy. You wanna go in with your, your numbers and say, this is what I feel I'm worth. And you have to have confidence in your ability and then be tough enough to follow through. Next slide. Right. Shelly, I've been keeping up with questions for you. Ready for a couple? Okay. Sure. Looks like we have we have about 10 minutes for questions. So we I see four that we haven't got to yet. And feel free to for our audience to go ahead and include more in the chat box. We'll get to as many as we can. So the first one is about in the interview setting. Can you uh, tell the employer that you'd rather not discuss salary yet without turning them off? You can try that. Um, you can always say, I'm not ready to talk about salary at this point because I want to know more about the job, what it entails, what your expectations are, um, and we can talk about that later. But chances are they might push for, for more information, and I think I addressed uh, how to do that. Good. You did. Okay, so I'm in the process of negotiating for maternity leave at a nonprofit. I appreciate any advice or guidance. There's no paid time off. Oh, okay. Um, I haven't really dealt with that issue before, but you know what? Um, if you all want to, I'm going to, um, if you, Amanda, is that who was talking to me? It sure is. If you want to write down that person's name um, or the person can email me, my email address is on the screen. Email me and I'll do some research and answer your question. 
So to the person that asked the question, I just put her email address into the chat. That might be the most efficient way to do it. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. During this time of high layoffs, would telling your boss that you're applying to other jobs give them an excuse to lay you off? Yes. <laughs> I've worked in some places and I've heard from other HR professionals that if they find out you're looking, they'll find a reason to let you go um, because they figure you're going to leave anyway. And so they might as well cut their losses and start looking for your replacement. So I would not share um, that you're looking to leave with your boss. That's smart advice. Um, can you speak more to salary negotiation during the economic crisis and employer controlled market? Yeah, so that's why it might be a little tougher to do a lot of negotiating, but you still want to, you still have to make ends meet, you still have to live your life. So, you know, you have to be negotiable, um, but they do too. And so you, you can't, if the jobs were 60 and they are for you 40, um, you know, I, I just don't think that's acceptable. But even in the economic downturn, people have to still make a living. So I think you should still plan to negotiate. There was a question about getting a copy of the presentation. I just want to say that we are live streaming and I put the Facebook address in the chat that we're live streaming to. So if you want to rewatch the session today, that's an option. Next question for you is if you're already covered by insurance, can you no negotiate to have the monetary value of that benefit added to the base salary offer? You can absolutely try. I will tell you, my husband is retired military and I don't need any, any health benefits. I'm on his health care. And so it is a big savings to the employer if you don't need benefits. Like I talked about earlier, um, it might be worth $20,000 to them to not have you on their health care plan or $15,000. Um, they might not give you all of that, but I know for where I work, if you're not on their health care, they give you an extra $350 a month in your salary um, because you're not using their health care. So you can absolutely ask for that. Wow, that would add up too. That's wonderful. It would. it would. Okay, so next question. What do you do when the application requires you to list the salaries of all your previous jobs? Well, I hate when people do that. <laughs> and I'm in HR. <laughs> and I, I think I mentioned that some states already have outlawed that. And it might end up being a federal law. I need to do some more research on that. But I've read a little bit about it recently. Um, because of the being underemployed. And if you, if you have to put it on there, you have to put it on there because I do another program on getting your application past the applicant tracking system. And one of the things I say is you have to fill out every field in your online application. If you skip a field or skip something, it'll automatically kick out your application. So if you don't provide the information, you might not even make it to an interview. Um, Sonny said, can you just put filler numbers? I would not. I would put actually what the amount is supposed to be, um, even if, you know, you're going to have to, you have to, you're going to have to meet all the requirements of the position to get through the applicant tracking system anyway. And so once you get to the, to the interview is when you can say, I've been working as XYZ, uh, you know, once they talk about salary and I, I know I'm worth more than that because I'm underemployed or I've been doing this for a while um, or I've been working as a contractor. Um, but you have, to, you have to fill in the fields and you have to be honest because they can verify it. Okay, I see three more right now. Um, what about cost of living adjustments? When moving to Kentucky, from Kentucky to other states, my salary may require 15K or 50K in increase, which is yep. most likely out of that position's range. Uh, what should I negotiate? Well, you can do research for that on the BLS too. Remember I said you can look up from your location? Well, look in the other location. So if you're going to move to Los Angeles, you can look on BLS and put in Los Angeles and all the other factors for what you are bringing to the table, MBA, 10 years of experience, whatever you are bringing, and it will tell you the average salary in Los Angeles for that role, and that will help you figure out what you are supposed to ask for. Absolutely. Um, next question, I'm interviewing uh, for a job this afternoon, uh, but I've been told unofficially the salary and it's, it's painfully low, 45k oh. less than what I was making at my last job. Ouch. Um, oh, that's bad. Um, there has been, 
um, there has been, it's been said that there, there would be potential to move up within 12 months. Is there any way that I could get a written statement promising that I would move up for sure in the 12 months? What do you advise? Oh, okay. Um, well, first of all, talking about the 45K less, you have to figure out if it's something that um, you can live with for 12 months at least. You know, if it's not going to cover your bills and you're going to live that year totally stressed out because you can't pay your pay your rent or whatever, um, then you might want to keep looking. But, you know, I would have an in-depth conversation about that potential for moving up. I don't know if they would be willing to give you something in writing because what if you are not a good fit for the job. Maybe you've been there six months and, and, you know, it's just not a good fit, or maybe you don't like it there, or, or, you know, they decide that they can't create new positions. Um, they can't really promise you that, unfortunately, because of factors that are beyond their control and beyond your control as well. You can have that very in-depth conversation and ask a lot of questions and ask about what's the reality. You know, what, what percent chance is this going to happen? If they say 90% chance, then okay. Um, but I, I don't think I would ask for it in writing because they probably, you know, they probably wouldn't give it to you because they can't promise. Okay, someone else is asking, what's the best strategy to initiate the negotiation properly? I'm not sure what that what that means. I'm wondering if they're meaning what kind of language or what example language you might use to, to approach the negotiation. Um, well, usually they're going to say maybe after after they've made you an offer. So so what do you expect for your salary? And then you want to say, well, I've done research on the Bureau of Labor Statistics for someone with my education and years of experience in this geographic market. And, and this is the range that that um, is stated that I should be earning or I expect to earn. Um, so I would like to start have a starting point of, of this range and maybe it's you know 70 to 80 you know give them a ten thousand dollar range to work with i don't know if that answers the question i'm not seeing anything else in the chat i think we're okay for that question there's a couple more coming through yeah um what's an appropriate range for a counter offer could we base it off the percentage of the proposed offer well, you could. Let's just say if they offer you 50 and you really want 60, you can say, you know, after they've offered you 50, you were, you know, I was really hoping for closer to 60. Is that something that's negotiable? And maybe they'll, maybe they'll come and meet you halfway at 55. Um, not so much a percentage, but just an amount. I mean, you can look at it as a percentage, um, but um, I think I would say, you know, I was hoping for X and maybe you can work around to the middle. But again, be sure that whatever that number is, you're gonna be okay with it because if they negotiate with you and they put good faith forward and they work on this with you for a little bit, and then you say, eh, I've decided to change my mind, then that's not gonna make you look good. I saw some more questions popping oh, through. Oh yeah, up. you've got several, more. now just so y'all know, we've got about maybe five more minutes for questions. We may not get to more than what's already in there. Someone is asking about your how to pass an ATS presentation. Do you have that recorded somewhere? Uh, I do actually, I did it about a month ago and I can, if you all want to send me an email, my email address is there on the screen, live.com. I'm happy to answer questions, send you a link to the other presentations that I've recorded. Happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah. This next question, oh, this is a good one. Okay, can you provide guidance um, of being offered a salary cut by 10 to 30K due to COVID or economic crisis for people with many years of experience, 25 plus years of experience who want to work for a company, but maybe not with that salary cut? So am I understanding this right? So they're in a job and they've been told they're going to get a salary cut during COVID. That's what you're saying? Okay, well, I think... I wouldn't be surprised by that because they are struggling and, you know, understand that they're trying their best to keep you employed. If they're cutting everyone's salary, it's a lot better than laying off a lot of people. So they're trying their best to keep you with some salary. Um, if you absolutely can't live with that, maybe you want to look elsewhere. But, you know, if you've been there for a long time and you value your relationship with that employer and you like your job, I would try to work with them until COVID is over or until they've 
they've come back in their financials enough to give you back your regular salary. But, you know, we have to understand what they're going through as well. Everyone is struggling right now. True. Okay, so this person says, I'm in the process of a career shift. I've had a few initial interviews where I've discussed my experience and disclosed my, disclosed my salary requirements, and then I haven't heard back. It's, it's, it's possible my experience or my salary wasn't a good match, but I'm not sure which. How can I get the interviewer to tell me where I fell short? Can you repeat the beginning of that? They've already interviewed? They've had a few initial interviews and then they disclosed their salary requirements and then never heard anything back. I would just, if you've been emailing back and forth with the recruiter or the HR person, I would just respond again or call and say, I just wanted to see where you are in the process. I know I talked to you several times before and I, you know, I was hoping that we would meet again. Um, but since I haven't heard anything, I wanted to check back and find out what the status is. Hopefully they'll have a discussion with you about uh, and I would call because if you email, they might be busy. They might not get back to you. I would call and um, I don't know if I would leave a message or not, because if you leave a message, they might not return your call. <laughs> I would call maybe until you get them on the phone. Um, you can leave a message if you want to, but um, you kind of want to, I don't want to say trap them, but get them on the phone so they have to, to answer your questions. But um yeah, it could be that your salary requirement was too high, but it could be something else. It could be, you know, another one of the people interviewed had a different qualification they were looking for that you lacked or something like that. So it might not be your salary requirement. Okay, two more. Okay. On LinkedIn, some of the positions state the salary. How accurate is this information? Are you saying that LinkedIn gives you a guess of the salary? Is that what that means, I, I think? They didn't say anything else. Okay. Usually the organization is the one that's posting it. She says, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, usually the organization posting it puts the salary. I haven't seen LinkedIn say, I think it's this much money. I think Indeed does that sometimes. Um, but again, I would do research and, and find out if you can. You know, I'll tell you another story. A job that I was interviewing for, and this was back in the 90s, so it was a long time ago, but I didn't know what I should ask for in the salary or what the range was. So I actually called the, the company, the organization, asked to speak to someone in HR. They put me through and I said, can you tell me the starting salary for this position? And she told me on the phone. So I know, <laughs> so you can always do that, I suppose. Um, I don't know if it'll work, but you can just ask. And um, then, you know, they'll tell you what it is so you'll know what the starting point would be wow i don't that's pretty lucky that you they were gave it to you shelly all right here's our last question for our speaker today um you mentioned salaries on glassdoor can be off by 30 to 40 percent does this include self-reported salaries provided by former or current employees for a specific company and role I actually said that Payscale and Salary.com are 30 to 40% off. Glassdoor is pretty on, right on because people are self-reporting. Um, Glassdoor doesn't say, you know, this is an assumption of how much this job pays. It typically says the person who interviewed says it pays 50 or, or whatever. So um, Payscale and Salary.com are the ones that are 30% off usually. The BLS excuse me, the BLS and Glassdoor are usually closer to right. All right, at this time, I'd love for us to fill that chat box with gratitude for our speaker, Shelly. Oh, thanks. And her wonderful content. We'll watch the chat box for you, Shelly. Oh, you're getting lots of love in the chat. Yeah, I can see. I can see them just popping through at the bottom of my screen. Awesome. All right, at this time, we're going to go camera off and we're going to shift over to Caroline to talk about active job leads. Thank you, Shelly. Oh my gosh, this is information we all need. We don't want to leave money on the table um, just because we were not comfortable or did not try to negotiate before we accepted an offer. So thank you for giving us tools to put our best foot forward and be successful. 
Uh, at this time, if we have any employers that would like to share an active job lead, raise your hand and we will give you uh, the spotlight in the chat box. Let's pay it forward and those that are online. Uh, if you have a job lead that you could share maybe with others in the group that could help someone else, uh, please share that in the chat box and help us pay it forward. And I'll let Ellie and Amanda keep an eye on that raised hand and see if we have any features, any um, employers with that feature up. Okay. Also, we wanna encourage you to sign up for our LinkedIn page between job club meetings. Sometimes we get job leads that are timely and we throw those on the LinkedIn page. So please join that so you won't miss a job offer. Good, we have an, a plant accounting supervisor role open at EKPC. Um, the website is in the chat box. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it, Andrea. Also appreciate all your support of Job Club. You've been a faithful employer um, supporting us for years. So thank you so much. All right, don't see any other hands. When we meet in person, uh, we always welcome employers to attend and share their job leads in person. And that's frequently the case. So we'll look forward to post COVID getting back to where we can have in person um, employer uh, sharing of job leads and sometimes even informal interviews on the spot happen at Job Club. Next. And now it's time for good news. This is a time when um, our partners share what's going on in each of their areas. And so Caroline and I were just talking this morning about the need and opportunity for finding innovative and educational programs virtually uh, during, the, during these, these specific times. And today I'd like to feature the 4-H Youth Development Program here in Fayette County. Now I want to uh, make a notation that the, the very same programs or e additional ones could be and are available in your local county and all you have to do is contact your local extension office. So let's see, when I check the newsletter, um, this month there is communication contest, virtual book club, entomology club, advanced horse, middle school leadership, bake along, POS STEM abilities, winter nationalists. So during the month of October, our 4-H staff has also uh, prepared and developed 4-H in a box. And these boxes contain just wonderful uh, at-home projects, uh, science related, and, um, and, and, and they're just, they're getting a great response from, from these educational 4-H in a boxes. So check out, Again, our Fayette County website, Extension website, as well as the 4-H Facebook page. And uh, be sure and check out your local Extension office as well. A few quick updates from UK Alumni Career Services. We have some programming coming up. On Wednesday, we'll be taking uh, live questions from our Facebook feed, uh, ukalumni.net forward slash career for more information on our career events. And then our career management webinar series, our next webinar is on interviewing. And Caroline is going to be doing a wonderful uh, workshop on November the 5th, the unretirement strategy, planning a new career after 50. And the registration for that is currently live. Next slide. Um, our graduate assistant, Queen Sullivan, is currently taking uh, clients from the job club community, and she's opened up a few resume and interview appointments uh, today, tomorrow, and a couple of days next week. I just put the link to that in the chat. You're welcome to sign up for those. On the next slide, we'll have more information on how you can schedule with me and Caroline for UK Alumni Career Services. Our um, appointments are a benefit of life and active membership in the UK Alumni Association, and we are nationally certified career counselors through the NCDA, National Career Development Association, and the topics that you can request appointments on are on the screen there. Our most common appointment topics are resume and cover letter review and job search strategy, along with mock interview too. 
And then I think there's one more slide, Ellie, and information on how to contact us, UK alumni career at uky.edu. It's a good email address to catch us. Okay, passing it over to Nicole for steps. All right, you guys hear me? Okay. Alrighty, so once again, um, I know I introduced myself earlier uh, before the presentation. I'm Nicole Waite. I'm employment specialist in a, um, UK HR here, and, and I work in temporary employment. And so, yeah, I just want to mention a couple of job leads to you guys. And um, let's see here. Feel free, of course, to uh, go over to our website, which I can actually put that in here. Um, so that you can review some of the jobs, some of the postings there, apply for some of those. But um, some of the leads that I have today uh, are maintenance techs, uh, especially for our UK campus. Um, we also have medical assistance. We still have a need for medical assistance, of course, especially you know during this time with COVID. Um, medical assistance and warehouse, uh, our warehouse um, positions, of course, on a on a rise as well as we bring in more products and things like that, more PPE, things like that. So yeah, you can head on over, like I said, to the UK Jobs website and just click on uh, the temporary employment tab. And um, you can also narrow down your search there, even if those positions don't sound interesting to you, there are several other positions available, but those are just some of the leads right now uh, that I don't wanna fail to mention. So, and let's see here. All righty. So, the network, sorry, here you guys, I got my slide, got my chat box in the way I couldn't read there. Okay. So, next time at Job Club, uh, October 27th, how to write a job winning resume. This is going to be a really good one for everyone. Um, it's going to be presented by Carolyn, our very own, I should say, Carolyn Francis, uh, the director of. of UK Alumni Career Services and Amanda Shagney. So uh, awesome. You guys, of course, have been here from Amanda a lot during this presentation. So uh, be sure to join us again. This will be a really, really good presentation and one that's that's very needed for those of us who are out here in the job search. So we look forward to seeing you again. And let's see, I'll give it back to Amanda. Thanks, Nicole. On behalf of the UK Alumni Association, uh, the Fayette County Cooperative Extension and UK HR Steps Temporary Employment, thank you so much for logging into Job Club today. Have a great day and we'll see you again on October the 27th. Bye all.